And uh, we set up for the next speaker, uh, that is Donald O'Connell. Are you ready, Donald? Yep. Uh, I am. Let's see, just share my screen. Uh, share. And... Okay, so hopefully you can see my slides now, can you? We see them well, and uh, you realize that you're starting at least five minutes late. So I did. please go ahead. Okay, thanks, thanks, Paul. Um, okay, well, thanks everybody. Uh, it's uh, nice to be here. And uh, I'd like to begin by obviously thanking the organizers for making all this stuff work. Uh, it's great to, to talk to everybody. And so I want to tell you all a little bit about uh, human pain row scalars and what they have to do with scattering amplitudes. So let me begin with the vial spinner, so the spinorial form of the curvature. Now, I have in mind vacuum spacetime, so there's going to be no difference between the full Riemann curvature and the vial curvature. So if you take that Riemann curvature and hit it with rotation generators in the spin representation, sigma mu nus, uh, you'll get this uh, vial spinner here with four spinner indices. This thing is you know, it's just totally symmetric under all these four spinners. So it's a spin two representation of SU2. It's got five complex numbers in it. Now, a, a useful way of thinking about this uh, vial spinner is to pick a basis of the spinner space at a given point. So I have in mind here some given point in space time. And the spinner basis, the spinner space there is a two dimensional thing. So I'll pick a basis of you know, a spinner K and a spinner eta. And I'm being a bit sneaky here. So I have in mind that this spinner K and its complex conjugate are going to uh, give you a vector K mu, which would be, you know, I have in mind this is going to be a light cone vector uh, directed to my observer sitting at a point X from some source. Now we can write out this vial spinner on this basis. So if you do it here, you find this expression here with the, the five numbers, the psi i, that are sitting inside the vial spinner. Uh, now, this last guy here, psi four, is particularly important. So it's known that these psi i's have various, uh, you know, they fall off with distance from uh, whatever source to the observer in specific ways. Uh, so in this psi four is the one that falls off slowest. So it falls off like one over or. So if you're very far away, this is the thing that uh, knows about uh, gravitational radiation essentially. So for this reason, this psi four is very interesting if you're somebody who cares about gravitational waveforms. So and indeed, uh, numerical relativists compute this for the, con the, the case of uh, black hole binary. Uh, and these are fantastic people. So you can just download uh, their simulations, which I did. So this is a simulation from the simulating extreme space times collaboration. So this is just a picture of this psi four uh, for a specific simulation. It's actually the simulation they did to understand the original LIGO discovery. So, so it's a kind of an interesting way for. Anyway, so the point is this psi four is sitting inside in here in the vial spinner. And uh, you know, it's basically the gravitational waveform. Okay, so now I'm not going to have bound black holes, unfortunately. Uh, I'm going to scatter black holes, like uh, what Justin had in mind at the start of his talk. So I'll take two black holes uh, separated by some impact parameter B, uh, you know, let them scatter, and emit some burst of gravitational radiation, uh, which we'd like to detect far away. And, and I'm going to just consider these black holes to be point-like objects. So the finite size effects will be higher order. And I'm only going to work to lowest order. So uh, the finite size effects will be higher order in perturbation theory. Um, and I'm going to have in mind some classical process. So I'm going to be taking classical limits of scattering amplitudes, et cetera. OK. Now, the psi 4 set up by that scattering situation, it turns out, is very closely connected to a scattering amplitude. So here's a formula relating them. Uh, so let me take you through some aspects of this formula for psi four. So first of all, I'm in frequency space. So uh, rather than in the time domain, I've just done a Fourier transform into frequency. Uh, there's a fall off with distance. So that's just this one over four fall off I was talking about. Uh, the various hats in this formula that get rid of factors of two pi. Uh, I've got impact parameters here for my particles relative to some origin. Uh, and then in the five-point amplitude, so the five-point amplitude is where the dynamics is really sitting. The wave vector of the gravitational radiation in this five-point amplitude, it's just got the, the frequency and then uh, you know, the sort of uh, one comma n hat. So n hat 
is the vector to the observer from the source. Uh, so it's the same sort of case I had in mind before. It's just this, this wave vector pointing at, pointing at the observer. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little der uh, a sketch of the derivation of this formula. It's, it's work in progress with David, this based on our, our work with Ben. Uh, so now, since I'm interested in a situation where we have an observer very far away from some source, uh, their linear, linear gravity is appropriate. So I can just write out the, uh, the gravitational field here. This is the quantum field. So the A's and A daggers here are creation and annihilation operators uh, for gravitons of helicity sigma. So I'm zooming over the helicities. Here are the polarization tensors depending on you know, the helicity. And there's some integral here over Lorentz invariant phase space. So this is just a standard mode decomposition. Now, if you take this thing uh, and differentiate it twice, you'll get the Riemann curvature. So I'll hit that with spinners, uh, you'll end up with this vial spinner. Now, this is an operator. It depends on, you know, it's got creation and annihilation operator sitting inside in here. Uh, now, when you do your differentiations and, you know, contracting your sigma matrices, et cetera, uh, you find four powers of spinners popping out, which kind of had to happen um, you know, for chronology reasons, et cetera. So this thing is going to be a psi four, it's automatic. Uh, and you know, of course, uh, since your spinners are chiral, you get projected onto a specific, uh, a specific helicity of your gravitational radiation. And you know, the other helicity is in the complex conjugate friend of this. Okay, so this is some, some uh, operator in a quantum field theory. Now I'm gonna measure its expectation. So uh, I have some observer sitting at some point X and I'll set, send in some initial state psi. And the psi is going to be made out of a two particle you know, two particles, but put into a wave packet so that, you know, so the classical approximation is valid. So that the particles will be, you know, localized in, in position and momentum space. So that's the initial stage. And then I time evolve it into the far future by just hitting it with the S matrix. So this then is uh, an expression for the, the expectation value of this vial operator. Um, you know, it's a valid thing in the classical and the quantum theory. So uh, you know, I get the same answer whether you use classical or quantum maths, it's just the same thing. Okay, now I'm gonna proceed by, you know, just writing S is one plus IT. I'll throw away the ones on the basis that there's no incoming gravitational radiation. And I'm also going to throw away the case where there's a T dagger and a T, like the, just because that's high order and perturbation theory. You know, we care about that. I'm just not gonna talk about it today. So when you do that, uh, the expression you get just takes this particular form here. Here's your four powers of spinners. Uh, you've got uh, T operators, et cetera, in here. Uh, and let me just focus on a couple of interesting aspects of this formula. So one, uh, obviously, where the amplitude's coming from. So well, they're coming from the T. Uh, now, there's two particles in the size on either side, and a creation operator acting you know, this direction here or in this direction here. So we always get uh, matrix elements of T between uh, a total of five particles. So it's going to be a five particle amplitude. Uh, you also have to worry about uh, these integrals. So there's an integral over on-shell phase space with some exponentials, so some sort of on-shell Fourier transform type thing. Now, in the case of interest, that integral just gives you a retarded propagator. So there's a one over distance fall off. That's the one over distance fall off I was talking about. Uh, but um, now there's really a, a full convolution to, to disentangle here. There's other momentum dependent uh, factors in this formula. Uh, and when you take that convolution apart, you find that your integral just has support um, in this region. So when uh, the uh, wave vector uh, of the radiation is pointing at the observer, you know, with some frequency, so you know, that, that's had to happen. Right? This is just amputation. Okay, so now what's left is a, an integral over uh, a frequency, you know, sort of natural to separate that off. So you end up with uh, Newman Penrose scalar in, in frequency space. Uh, now, everything else in this formula, well, I talked about this one over or in the amplitude, pretty much everything else just comes out from these, um, these wave functions, uh, which are constrained by momentum conservation and by on-shell conditions. So really all that's left is a little bit of Fourier transform. So that's uh, Newman Penrose scalar um, in terms of scattering amplitudes. Now the amplitude here, you can compute it whatever way you want, right? Um, it's just an amplitude you can compute it with you know, generalized unitarity, you can double copy, you can do whatever you want uh, in order to get this amplitude. So you can go up to town on it. Uh, and this is a way of getting gravitational waveforms without ever touching general relativity. 
Uh, so in that respect, uh, so this work is very similar to a uh, uh, famous work of Walter and Alec, uh, who were the first to say that um, the gravitational radiation when you've got two scattering black holes is something that can double copy. So uh, to a certain extent, this, this provides a perspective on their work that uh, you know, there's a double copy there because the thing they're computing is an amplitude. Uh, but with this uh, setup, we can go to whatever order you want. So there's a systematic setup here. You know, it's always going to be in terms of integrals over our amplitudes. Uh, so we could go to whatever order you want by including loops, etc. And the integrals you, you find are sort of Bessel functions or integrals over Bessel functions. And um, I've shown the integrals here. You know, I, I perform the integrals and uh, switch back to the time domain, uh, not in the gravitational case, but in the closely connected uh, electrodynamic case. So you know, here's that burst of radiation from some scattering. Uh, and indeed, uh, it was purely classically uh, this gravitational case, the gravitational scattering was studied by Kovacs and Thorne, who find similar Bessel functions, et cetera. Uh, so this, uh, this matches uh, some stuff that's known in the classical literature. OK, so well, the point here is this newman penrose scalar is a very close friend of scattering amplitudes, you know, particularly of helicity amplitudes. You know, the helicity matches nicely on both sides here. Now, another thing that we care about in the world of uh, scattering amplitudes, what we've been talking about is, rather than just waves, are our, our actual background. So the Schwarzschild background. Uh, there's some story about how there's a relation, some double copy relation involving Schwarzschild and involving care and this funny root care that Justin was just talking about. Uh, now, from the point of view of these Newman Penrose scalars, there is a bit of a bug here, which is that the Newman Penrose scalar, the full vial spinner of uh, a stationary exact solution, something like here, uh, falls off too fast. It falls off like one over R cubed. Right? And that's for you know, a very good reason. The graviton corresponding to that care, you know, it's not on shell, it's a potential graviton. Uh, so you're not going to get this one over R fall off. Uh, so this fall off, you know, it's slow because of Minkowski's signature. And the way I think about it is the three point amplitude zero. It doesn't really exist in Minkowski's. But of course, in the world of scattering amplitudes, you know, yeah, we don't have to stick in Minkowski space. We can perfectly well analytically continue to uh, other signatures, for example, 2 2 signature. Uh, and then you find that the Newman Penrose scalars and the Vol spinner don't fall off uh, so fast. Uh, they fall off like one over or. Now, because you know, that graviton really can go on shell in, in this uh, funny signature spacetime. Uh, so here's the uh, ball spinner for, uh, for a static particle in 2-2 signature. I should say it's really the uh, leading uh, part of it at large distances. Now, it comes out in terms of some integral. Uh, this integral here is it's singular, it's quite singular. But on the other hand, it's universal. You know, it's just about uh, massless particles, uh, one over k squared on shell conditions, uh, momentum conservation, and it's some Fourier transform. So it's a completely universal object. It doesn't know anything about the dynamics of the theory. It's just like a one over or. Uh, the dynamics is really just in that scattering amplitude that's sitting there. Maybe dynamics is the wrong word. The characterization of the solution is just sitting in that scattering amplitude right there. So and indeed, uh, you can. Uh, have a bit of fun with that. So you take uh, the Schwarzschild or the friend of Schwarzschild in 2 2 signature space time, so a static mass, it's not doing anything, uh, and uh, compute its uh, false spinners, then uh, you can pull off the three point amplitude for a massive particle interacting with the graphite. That thing really exists in that signature, so, so it's right there. Okay, so there's uh, a nice connection between vol spinners and three point amplitudes in. 2 2 signature space times. Now, on the other hand, back in Minkowski space, uh, we still know that there's something interesting going on connecting file spinners and amplitudes somehow. So there's some exact double copy that, uh, that we understand for uh, a set of you know, some family of solutions in, in Minkowski space and uh, things we care about, like uh, like Schwarzschild and CARE. So uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, maybe not quite so evident uh, right now how to connect extra amplitude. So, uh, so what we're going to do for the rest of this talk is uh, connect this uh, spinorial form of the double copy uh, in a more concrete way just to scattering amplitudes. Uh, and actually, what I what I want to say is that you can learn uh, about amplitudes from uh, these uh, these interesting 
exact solutions on this double copy. Okay, so to do so, I'm gonna just in introduce a slightly, uh, slightly different way of thinking about this file spinner. So I can make a polynomial out of it by picking uh, a generic spinner Xi and just hooking up their indices like this. Uh, so uh, you replace the file spinner then with a polynomial, a fourth degree polynomial in, uh, in the components of this, this spinner. And you can do the same thing for gauge series. So take a field strength, F and U, hit it with sigma matrices to get a spinorial thing, a, a Maxwell spinner, uh, and then contract those indices against two powers of spinners, and I'll get a, I'll get a second order polynomial with three numbers in it. Okay, so now if you do that, uh, it's easy to write uh, expressions for these various uh, uh, polynomials. So this is the one in Schwarzschild. There's the one over x cubed I was complaining about in Minkowski space. Uh, it's got some mass. Here's the Coulomb charge, there's one over x squared, just the Coulomb field, it's a charge. Uh, you can see some evidence of double copies going on here. Uh, now there is an important role uh, for the, you know, the friend of the Biogen scalar in this context. Um, the scalar field plays a role here. I'm, it's not gonna be so relevant for what I'm talking about, uh, which is a little bit more KLT, like I guess at three point level. Uh, but anyway, so, uh, you can still uh, more or less by eye see the double copy. Now, reality of these solutions means that the, the vile spinner uh, and the antichiral vile spinner, so the one with dotted indices, uh, just have to be complex conjugates of one another. So this complex conjugation is there uh, also for the, the Coulomb charge. There's some very trivial operations we can perform on these file spinners and um, Maxwell spinners without changing any of the physics. So one thing I can do, for example, is just rescale. So I can multiply the mass by a, by a real number. It doesn't change anything. Multiply the charge by a real number. Again, you know, these just still solutions, right? Um, or I can translate things around. So I can move my mass a little bit uh, or move my charge. That's a symmetry, it doesn't change the physics. But associated with these trivial operations are non-trivial operations. Uh, and these non-trivial operations just correspond to, instead of multiplying by a real number, multiplying by a complex number. So if I multiply the Coulomb charge by a complex number uh, and take care to uh, multiply the uh, antichiral Maxwell spinner by the complex conjugate of that, so the reality condition is still satisfied, then, well, the, the phase part of this complex number upgrades the charge to a charge in a magnetic charge. So it implements electromagnetic duality for you. In gravity, uh, starting from a mass, the phase introduces a new charge called a nut charge. Uh, so there's some, some nut charge going around in general relativity in four dimensions. The complex part of the translations also do something uh, potentially more interesting. So if we start with Schwarzschild uh, and translate with, with some complex uh, part of the translation, then uh, we induce a spin. So you start from Schwarzschild, you end up with care. Uh, similarly, uh, for this uh, uh, Electromagnetic case, uh, you can spin the, the Coulomb charge up to this root care thing that Justin was talking about. Uh, and in the, the gravitational case, when you have both the, the nut charge and the spin, and you know, there's this exact solution called kerr -Tabner. Okay, so now why am I telling you about this? It's because uh, there's an indirect link we can make to scattering amplitudes. Uh, so even though the three-point amplitude uh, doesn't go on shell, I can certainly make a four-point amplitude by scattering something off uh, this background. So now, if I've got a four-point amplitude, uh, perfectly fine, obviously, and there is uh, a classical observable, which I can uh, construct out of four-point amplitudes, this impulse that uh, David and Ben and I wrote about uh, a little while ago. Now, this classical thing, this impulse, so it's just a change in momentum of this light particle, is also something I could compute by purely classical means. So if I have some idea of how the backgrounds double copy, uh, I have some idea of uh, what kind of things I should compute and we can extract information on the kind of scattering amplitudes uh, that are related to these funny solutions as Karatev nut solution, for example, or the, these Dion solutions. Now, I'm only gonna talk about the Dion solution. Yutin, I think is gonna talk a little bit more about uh, Tav nut and maybe even the uh, more general things. So, no, so to understand uh, scattering amplitudes for dions, uh, all we do again is just exploit that electromagnetic duality. So I know that these dion, uh, that I know that we can rotate the field strength um, under electromagnetic duality just through a, a, an angle. So this is just the E's and B's getting mixed together. The F star is just the dual. 
And so that's just some rotation on the electric and magnetic fields. In terms of the self or anti-self dual parts of the field strength, uh, this rotation is just a pure phase rotation, uh, which is a handy thing to know. Uh, and the point about this rotation, of course, is that if I start with a pure charge, uh, you can switch on a magnetic charge through this rotation, as you can kind of see there by, uh, by looking at the Maxwell equation. OK, so now what about amplitude? So of course, I'm interested in helicity amplitudes. And the nice thing about helicity amplitudes is that they're related to self or anti-self dual fields directly. So the duality right, rotation acts on the helicity amplitudes just by rotating your plus helicity by a, an angle theta and your minus helicity by an angle you know, the opposite, minus theta. Uh, now, the angle's only physical if it's a misalignment with other particles. So if I rotate everything, you haven't changed anything. Right? It's only if I rotate some things and leave everything else uh, invariant that you've, you've performed something you've done that. And I should say that you know this business of magnetic amplitudes, etc. I, you know, that one could do it. I, I learned from uh, Simon and Zahra in their paper. Okay, so let's get back to scattering uh, a particle off a dion. So here's my dion, and um, I've switched on some angle in its scattering amplitudes, and um, I can scatter a light, just a pure electric charge, off the dion. Uh, now you could compute this uh, four-point amplitude, for example, by PCFW or something like that. Uh, and you find that the amplitudes are gauge dependent. Uh, however, the observable is gauge invariant. Now, this the fact that the amplitude is gauge dependent, again, uh, is discussed by Simon and Zahra. So that's expected. Uh, but the observable, of course, it's observable. It doesn't depend on the gauge that the law goes through. OK, so what's the point about this? So if we start with you know, the Coulomb charge, we know there's a double copy to Schwarzschild. Uh, but there's also a duality operation we can perform that uh, upgrades Coulomb to a dion. At the level of scattering amplitudes, the double copy, you just square the amplitude for you know, your Coulomb charge, your static charge, interacting with a photon. And the duality operation just uh, introduces this angle theta in uh, that scattering amplitude. Now, as Uten will say, uh, in the double copy, if you double copy this uh, simple amplitude for the diode, you indeed find uh, the result you want for scattering things off tabna. And that amplitude is exactly what you think it is. You just, uh, you just perform a duality rotation if you want on the gravitational amplitude or just double copy the uh, electrodynamic thing. Now, going back to these trivial little operations that became non-trivial for those fall spinners, you think there should be another set of arrows here that I should be able to spin things up. So beginning with uh, Schwarzschild, I should be able to spin it up to Kerr. Uh, and beginning with Coulomb, I should be able to spin up to this funny root Kerr thing. Uh, and indeed, that's the case. And the amplitudes associated with these are, again, just a trivial little deformation. I think, again, Newton will talk about these. So in this case, uh, the deformation depends on the spin vector, this A that Justin was talking about, and some momentum transfer. Uh, and then you can complete this diagram. So you can spin up the dion, and double copy it to this Kerr-Tab nut solution, which is also what you obtain by, let's say, magnetizing uh, the Kerr black hole. Uh, and associated with these are Again, uh, very simple deformations at the level of scattering amplitudes. Uh, so uh, you just have, uh, you just get to multiply these two deformations, uh, uh, the, the duality or the spinning up. Uh, and this is work, uh, well, this, this last bit here about Kerr-Tab note is work in progress uh, with Will Emond, Yuri Kahl, Yutin Huang, uh, Nathan Moynihan, and I. Okay, so uh, that's what I wanted to tell you about. And there's, there's obviously a very close connection between scattering amplitudes and these Newman Penrose scalars. Um, and that's great because we can use it for things like uh, computing gravitational waveforms, uh, used for scattering from amplitudes. Um, there is something going on about relations between three point amplitudes and uh, stationary classical solutions, which, uh, which is a fun thing to play about and leads to this cube of related amplitudes and related backgrounds. Uh, it's very natural to consider the double copy uh, at the level of wild spinner, partially because if you care about Einstein gravity, you know, uh, the double copy, um, the wild spinner is chiral, so it allows you to, to score directly to uh, GOR and not get any funny other fields you don't want switched on. Um, and then, well, for the future, uh, it would really would be nice to be doing uh, uh, directly doing uh, band states, I think, in, from this perspective. Uh, so. For that reason, let me draw some attention to his recent work of uh, Gregor and Raphael on uh, uh, analytically continuing between the scattering and band state cases. Okay. okay, that's it. Okay, thanks a lot, Donald. We give you an applause. You can hear that. Let's see if there are some questions. Very loudly.
Can I ask a question if nobody else has one? Or please, Lance. Absolutely. So, uh, is it true that Taubnut is not asymptotically uh, flat space time? Yeah, that's right. yeah. And so the nature of the scattering states at infinity must be different. And maybe that's also true in the the square root of it. If you have a magnetic charge in the states near the Dirac string, <laughs> yeah. It, it, the, are those things related, Donald? Uh, they are. Yeah. Uh, so there are these funny there are these funny um, uh, conical singularities running around. Now you, you can move them around. I mean, my point of view on them is, is, you know, I just don't scatter things that are too close to singularities and everything works out. So time load is locally, uh, it's locally Minkowski. So, so uh, you're, you're sort of in good shape. It's, it's not like you've really messed up infinity. Uh, well, it's not like- so you've It's really like a gravitational- Provided you keep the these- string somehow? Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, some people, you know, it is possible to uh, take a quotient of time load to get rid of the singularities, but that introduces uh, close time like curves. So, uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, you'll find people doing funny things with Tableau. But what the attitude that we, we've been adopting um, is keep the singularities, just keep far away from them. Okay, thanks. Okay, Nima has a question. Uh, Donald, uh, um, have, uh, uh, have you, or do you know if it's in the literature somewhere, um, uh, have people uh, explored what the sort of full, the analog of the uh, of the eternal black hole, the like full complete crustal extension, um, for either either Schwarzschild or Kara, uh, probably even more naturally for Kara, uh, looks like in two two signature. You 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 talked about how some things make sense in uh, two two signature, but it'd be really fascinating to figure out what the actual metric looks like in two two signature. It's I think it's it's pretty likely that this that these two two black holes. Will be very important instantons in 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 uh, the well the, the analog of important instantons in uh, gravity when it comes to questions about scattering amplitudes. Um, so it'd be really really interesting to know something about that. I, I I haven't seen them discussed in the literature, but I don't know the literature well. Do you know if it's been looked at, or have you looked at it? Um, yeah, I haven't found them. Now it might be that there that there is stuff, but I I haven't found much. I think you know, like I kind of get the impression. Yeah, you know, maybe just because I'm not very good at finding stuff in the literature, but I kind of get the impression that people think two two is quite funny, you know, and uh, so people like to do Minkowski or Euclidean and not two two. So, but yeah, I mean, it would be fantastic if if there was some stuff out there, and um, you know, it certainly saved me trying to solve these stupid equations. Um, All right. Actually, uh, can, I ask, can I ask a quick question? Actually, this is Cliff. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't find where the uh, hand raise is. So uh, thanks for the nice talk, Donald. Um, quick question. Uh, you had these kind of dionic or uh, dionically uh, charged couplings. Um, and people always wonder whether you could build a field theory with magnetic and electric degrees of freedom and whether you can make kind of sense of perturbation theory. Do you have yeah. any comment on that? Yeah, uh, well, uh, no, nothing beyond, I guess, what I'm doing is classical. So uh, normally, you know, you, you shy away from, um, you know, uh, magnetic charges because of the quantization condition, right? So, uh, you know, your perturbation theory is, is usually pretty crappy, right? You know, charges are big. Uh, but here, uh, we've got an impact parameter downstairs. So uh, the, you know, the perturbation theory is essentially in the scattering angle, which we can keep small even for even for magnetically charged things. So, so there's no problem in, in doing uh, these sort of calculations uh, in, in the classical theory. Uh, but if you want to have a full, you know, quantum Lagrangian, uh, potentially you'd be in trouble. I, I think at tree level it shouldn't be such a big deal. Do you know if I actually was wondering, could you try putting this into generalized unitarity and just try to build a loop amplitude? Like, what if you just forgot that there should be a problem and just tried building an amplitude? Has this been attempted? They're basically taking these kind of tree level classical elements and like building a loop object out of them. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know. I, I don't know if anybody has done it. Okay, thank you. Can, All right, uh, Ricardo, uh, Ricardo Montero has also been waiting to ask a question. Hi, thanks, Donald. Um, so you discussed um, these, uh, so that there are a number of Penrose uh, scalars, and you discussed this Psi 2, which is like a potential, and also Psi 4, which was like the radiation. Yeah, right. Um, do you see what is the rule here for Psi 3? No, um, no, um, I, I haven't played around much with Psi 3. Um, uh, no, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I think of it as just something to do with induction, but. Um, um, so I, I, I mean, maybe you could see something with Psi three in in, 
yeah, maybe you could see something with Luke Kerr or something like that, or uh, uh, you know, it's double copy. But I, I don't have much to say about it. Thanks. Okay, David Broadhurst had a question. He's been waiting to ask a question, hasn't he? Yes, I'm a, a, a bemused spectator. Um, I got very lost when you went off, in, when you started two timing, when you went off into a two two signature to. It make was only one slide, so. Like one R. I don't understand what scattering is with two times. Mm. I don't know how to define it. Well, you can, it's, certainly, it's certainly a weird thing, you know. I mean, uh, you, you, you can scatter in ways you're not allowed to scatter otherwise. That, that's uh, why the three point amplitude is there. I mean, essentially what I'm doing is I'm lining up one particle in one time direction and scattering another particle over in another time direction. That, that's how you get these, uh, these interesting uh, uh, on-shell gravitons for something that's static, which you don't see in Minkowski space. I mean, may maybe, maybe the following remark would help. So, um, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's a bit pretty weird situation, right? But uh, so I've just got one, one particle, so it's perfectly static. Uh, it's my source. So I line it up in some time direction. Now, the weird thing about 2-2 is you have another time direction. Yeah. Uh, so I have an observer, or I'm interested in observing uh, corresponding to uh, the other time direction. So from if you think about uh, moving along in the other time direction, uh, you'll only be able to see the static charge for a brief period of time. Uh, so there's some window when you can observe it. Uh, so and it's it, it's that phenomenon that that leads to this uh, enhanced fall off. Uh, so uh, essentially, it acts uh, as an impulsive source uh, from the other time direction. So it switches on a burst of radiation, and you can you, you can uh, you can sense it uh, from the point of view of scattering amplitudes. Uh, so I mean, in terms of solving the equations of motion, the classical equations, I mean, all you do is follow your nose. So you can uh, compute, for example, the, the field strength, uh, and then uh, sorry, uh, uh, compute the field by by performing the usual Fourier integral, uh, for example, and then differentiate to get the uh, the field strength. The derivatives will hit some weird, uh, you know, there's some weird delta function, some weird theta function, in which you can differentiate to get delta functions, and that's what it leads to enhanced follow. So obviously they're pretty weird. I mean, you know, I mean, this is this is not physical stuff, but nevertheless, you know, they they can access some things we we do care about these three point amplitudes. Okay. Right, Donald, we have a question also from Julio. Julio, I think you have to unmute yourself because you're a co-host. Yeah. You to... Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. So it's building on Cliff's question. Uh, so did, I thought that the, the amplitudes were Lorentz invariant and everything when the particles are mutually local. So there is no problem if they have electric and magnetic charges as long as they satisfy the quantization condition, meaning they don't see this like string singularity. Is, is, that, is that correct? Or, uh, or are you considering something more general than that? Well, let's see. So the three-point amplitudes are perfectly fine. Uh, the four-point amplitude has this dependence on essentially some direction, which you can think of as being a direction of a drag string. Um, so it's just sitting there in that four-point amplitude. Um, so I, I guess what what the point I, uh, the point of view that Simon and Zahra adopt in their paper is that the amplitudes become sections of a line bundle uh, when there is a, when there's a magnetic charge switched on. So there's there's a gauge transformation when you go from one uh, from one side to the other, um, even if they're mutually local. Let me see, what's the word mutually local mean in this context? It just means they satisfy the direct quantization condition. Uh, uh, which typically that means that yeah, um, I cannot see the singularity, right? I, I, uh, I, I'm not completely sure, but uh, I don't see how the, the dependence in that four point amplitude would go away if you impose the, the uh, quantization. I, I think what the, what the quantization condition will guarantee is that they paste together into a well-defined uh, bundle, uh, but I don't think it gets rid of this, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that a gauge transforms from one side of the model to the other. So actually, maybe I just interject a comment, which is that um, there was this paper by, I think, John Turning and collaborators some while ago, where they were looking at soft theorems coming off magnetic monopoles. Oh, cool. And I think yeah. one of their claims was that only if direct, uh, direct charge quantization was satisfied, would you have a soft theorem that was local? Hmm. Okay. So I'd mention it because it may address the Julio's question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And typically, if you have things which are mutually non local, the commutation relations are not local, of, like of the whatever quantum operators. But if they're mm -hmm. mutually local, everything is fine. 
Right. I think something is restored when you uh, restore direct charge quantization. So I think that's consistent with what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that's right. I mean, I think the whole thing doesn't really make sense unless you have that. Um, I mean, classically, it's not such a big deal, but um, but if you want to understand uh, how these things pace together and um, to give you a well-defined bundle, it's a, it, the direct quantization mutation is necessary. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions, uh, Donald. So I think we stop here and thank you again. Give okay, you an applause. You. And um, this was the second talk of this morning. Uh, we'll now have a break until uh, 11 o'clock uh, Eastern.